because it is significant that we learn to wait on the Lord. Remember, as I shared, many have passed up the right job, the right career, have married the wrong spouse, have taken the wrong church, have done so many things because they would not wait on the Lord. So it is significant, it is important that you and I learn the lesson of waiting on the Lord. Because, first of all, God put it in His Word, so He's going to call us and challenge us to wait on Him. There are going to be those things in life that God has in store for you and me, but He's not going to bring them immediately. He is going to challenge you and call you to wait. Now, friend, if you're serious about your Christian life and being in the will of God, in the center of the will of God, He is going to call you to wait. There are a lot of people that are good, uh, respectable people that have absolutely missed God's best because they, for one reason or the other would not wait on the Lord. And uh, we live in a success-oriented society, so here's what we say. We want things right now. We want it when we want it, the way we want it. And so we'll say, surely it's, it's time for me to walk through this door. It's time for me to have this job, or it's time for me to have this spouse. So, so we can manipulate our lives into destruction. As a matter of fact, you want to know the honest truth. Probably tonight, sitting all over the world, one of the greatest problems in so many individuals' lives is this. They have never learned to make the right decisions in life, and that's what brings the pain and the misery in and upon their heart. And you can absolutely devastate your life by not waiting. And so I want you just to follow along and jot some of these down. So first of all, let me define what is waiting. What is waiting? Well, first of all, waiting is a very positive, deliberate act of our will. Waiting is that point where you stay in your present post because you don't know what God has next. You know, you don't know the next step. You don't know where God is leading, so you just stay where you are. Now, sometimes uh, that's very challenging because somebody will say, well, well why, don't you, why don't you move? Why don't you do this? And uh, when we wait on the Lord, it means that we pause for further instruction. Let me give you an example out of the Old Testament. Joseph in the Old Testament, God called him at the age of 17 to be in command of Egypt when the time was right. But did you know that did not come till 13 years later? Joseph went into the prison. He uh, ended up in Potiphar's, in Potiphar's house and uh, seduced by Potiphar's wife. And so... One of the realities that Joseph found in his life is God called him to something, but he had to wait. And so we pause and wait for further instruction. We stay where God tells us to stay. And uh, when you and I wait on the Lord, we wait on him to open the doors at his timing. Now, there are a lot of doors that God has for your life and my life, but the timing isn't right. You know, just as... uh, You want your children to marry. I know that if I ask Mike and Becky, you know, do you want Owen to get married? They'd say absolutely someday when the timing is right, but not next year or not 15 years from now when the timing is right. Maybe when he's 40, 45, 50, something like that. The reality of it is every one of us, every one of us, if you belong to God and are God's son, God's daughter, he's going to call you to wait. Why? Because your life is of significant importance to God. Don't you ever get the idea that, well, God's called me to wait, so he's not interested in my life. Do you realize what waiting does? Waiting builds your character. Waiting is that point where you just say, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to stay where God tells me to stay. And so, you know... Uh, Waiting simply means that we're going to just stay where God tells us. We're not going to move until God says move. And uh, it's sort of like this. You wake up every morning, you walk with God, you report to God for duty. But if he doesn't give you uh, an assignment, if He, you you know that you're doing what you know God's told you to do, you just keep doing that day in and day out until he gives you an assignment. Listen, Joseph wasn't ready for second in command in Egypt until the age of 30, though God called him at the age of 17. So it is imperative that you understand that if you don't learn the lesson of waiting, you can miss the right spouse, you can miss the right vocation, you can miss the right career, and it's happening every day that you and I live. People are missing, and they're wondering, God, why don't you love me? Well, God does love us, but he calls us to wait. David said it very clearly, wait on the Lord. So, second of all, 
Since waiting is a deliberate act of our will and we stay at our present post until God says to move, why in the world does God call us to wait? Well, there are so many specific reasons why God calls us to wait. First of all, we may not be ready for what God has in store for us. You know, there is a timing to everything God has. And uh, there are those things that God has in store for your life, but you're not ready for them yet. You're not ready spiritually. You're not ready emotionally. You're not ready psychologically. So you're just not ready for them. And whenever God calls you to wait, it's not that God is just saying, well, I want to just see if I can mess with your emotional system. That's not the case at all. What God is doing is this. He is refining us, and He is challenging us. He is testing our faith, and uh, He is in the process of equipping. Listen, there is something powerful that is involved in waiting. Because a lot of people won't do it. A lot of people will say, well, you know what? God's not giving me a direction, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make the decision myself. And they get themselves in a hellish mess. And I'm here to tell you tonight, it doesn't matter who you are and what name you may have or how long you've been a Christian, you can get your life and we can even get God's church in a hellish mess by not waiting on Him. Can we not? Amen? How many people do it? How many churches are in a mess tonight because they didn't wait on God? How many churches have the wrong pastor because they didn't wait upon God? How many pastors went to the wrong church because they didn't wait upon God? And so God's plan, you know, He's in the process of preparing us. And and second of all, God's plan is not ready for us at that moment. You know, God has a plan, but He knows what it's going to require of your life. He knows the devotion and the dedication. And maybe you're not ready. You're, you're not spiritually ready for it. Think about it for a moment. When God called uh, Joshua to march around the walls of Jericho, nothing happened for six days. You remember God told Joshua to march around the walls, and he did that once a day, and then he was to blow the trumpet seven days, and then the walls would come down. But the first day, nothing happened. He waited and trusted and waited and trusted and did what God said. Second day, he did the same thing. Third day, he did the same thing. Why does God call you and me to wait? One, to challenge our faith. You see, when you look in the story of of Joshua and the walls of Jericho, here he was marching and nothing happened. And sometimes in our waiting, here's what God says, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust my word? Do you know why so many Christians are in messes? Because we won't trust God's word. Listen, has God ever failed anybody that's trusted Him? Yes or no? No. But why do so many people get in in trouble? Because they won't trust God. And so, God, uh, you know, God's plan isn't ready for us. We're not ready for God's plan. And another thing that happens is He sifts our motives. You know, sometimes God don't open a door for your life because He's sifting your motives. Let me give you one of the uh, most uh, simple explanations and Suppose you're praying for a family member that's lost. You're praying for them, and you're praying for them, and it seems like nothing happens. And you say, but I'm praying for them. I'm doing the right thing. I'm praying that they be saved. But what's the motivation behind it? You see, the Bible says God looks on the outside, or man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Do you realize we can pray for somebody to be saved for all the wrong reasons? We can pray for them to be saved not for the glory of God, Not that he will be honored, but so they will stop making life emotional hell for us. Do you think God is pleased with that type of motive? Lord, I pray that you save my nephew, my niece, my uncle, my aunt, my brother, my sister, because they're making life torment on us. The Bible makes it very clear. God will always sift our motives. And so, you know, if we're consumed with something so much, God is going to check our motives. When you pray for a person that is lost... What is your motive? Is your motive self-centered or God-centered? You know, well, I want to, I want to see them saved. But what's the reason you want to see them saved? You say, well, I don't, I want them to see them saved because, you know, I don't want them to see them die lost. Well, that's a good motive. That's a right motive. But if you say, I want to see them saved, so they're making life torment for me because I've had people share with me and my office say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Pray for my, and they named their family member's name. They're making life emotional hell for me. Do you realize that that's a, not the most wise motive? Now, I understand that, and, and I sympathize with that. 
But here's what God does. He's wanting to check our motives. He's wanting to sift our motives. And some things that we want so much, as, as God looks at our motives, our motives are impure. And so, God calls us to wait. He calls us to wait because we're not ready for the assignment. The assignment's not ready for us. He's challenging our faith. He's sifting our motives. And so, you see, God, there's a very deliberate action that's taking place when you wait. You know, because think about it. Can't God do anything at any time He wants to? Sure He could. If He could answer your prayers, you pray and then boom, the prayer's answered. You pray again, boom, the prayer's answered. You pray again, boom, the prayer's answered. What faith would there be in that? There's no building of any faith. There's no building of any courage on our part. So, you know, God's nature and character is such that He won't allow any competitors in our life. One of the reasons He will, he will cause you to wait is this. Do you think that God knows your life completely, absolutely, totally, and perfectly? You better believe He does. And He's looking, what competitors are there in your life? And so sometimes we're praying and He just causes us to wait because He sees all the competitors that are there. He sees that our family's more important than He is. He sees that things are more important than He is. And so He just doesn't respond in the affirmative for what we're praying for. Because he's wanting to really challenge our faith. What is it that is so important to you? And the reality is the Bible says God is a jealous God. That means that he will allow no competitors in our life. And so, you know, God calls us to wait. It's not an accidental thing. It's not a, a, something that's just a happenstance on his part. But God calls us to wait deliberately and intentionally. Now, the question is, how are we to wait? How in the world are we to wait? Well, I can tell you how we do wait a lot of times. A lot of times we have something that we're praying for or we're waiting on. And, you know, a young man is waiting for that spouse, uh, for God to bring across his life, or that young woman's waiting for a husband or someone else is waiting for a job. And here's a few ways that we wait. You know, you can find them all throughout Scripture. Some ways, times we wait nervously. We have that nervous... Uh, anticipation. We're impatient. And uh, sometimes if, if God doesn't move when we want Him to move, we're going to go ahead and move anyway. And I'm here to tell you, I wish I could say this, if I could say it a thousand times and you would listen, I would say it a thousand times because I'm here to tell you some of my closest and dearest friends have messed their lives up because they would not wait on the living God. They, they've decided to take things into their own hands. And so, sometimes we're just anxious and we're excited. But the Bible tells us how we're to wait. First of all, the Bible says, number one, we're to wait quietly. Now, what does it mean? It means that you just wait quietly with that sense in your spirit that God knows. He knows what you're waiting on. He knows why you're waiting. In other words, if you're waiting on something specific, you just wait and you pray, and Lord, I just pray your will be done. I'm going to wait, and if, by the way, if that's out of your will, you cancel my request. So the Bible says in Lamentation, wait patiently, and we're to wait quietly. Romans chapter 8 says we're to wait patiently. In other words, you know, God's not forgotten you. He knows where you are. Don't you think that He knows where you are? And, and since He knows where you are, He can cause anybody in the world to know where you are at any given time. Don't you know that? Listen, He knows where you are. Every one of us are standing in a longitude and latitude right now. In other words, there is an absolute location you're standing or sitting in. He can cause anybody under His heaven to know where you are. So why should you and I manipulate life when God knows where we are? Why should we try to manipulate our circumstances when the sovereign God of the universe knows us by name, knows where we are, and He can cause anybody in the world to know where you and I are at any given time. So you wait patiently. You wait in hope. Wait in hope means, it's not, hope is not a wish, but the word hope in the Bible means a divine certainty. David said, I waited and the Lord delivered me. In other words, I found that every time I waited on God, He delivered me. And here's the reality. When you and I wait upon the Lord, the Bible says He will make it His business. You get that? He will make it His business 
to deliver his children. Do you think God adopted you into his family by the shed blood of his son to forget you? Listen, you cannot be forgotten by holy God. That is an absolute impossibility. And so we're to wait in hope. We're to wait in hope saying, Lord, I know you know where I am. I know you know what I need. I know you know what my situation is. I know you know that I have loved ones that are lost, but I'm going to pray and I'm going to thank you in advance for saving their soul. I'm going to thank you in advance for convicting them of sin, judgment, and righteousness. And I'm waiting in hope. And uh, the Bible says we're to wait in courage. You know, David said it again in this, in this uh, verse 14. He said, be of good courage. You know why? Because it takes courage to wait. Look at the people who have manipulated their life, and if you ask them, maybe some preacher or somebody got out, why did you do what you did? Well, I didn't think God was going to come through. Ask a young man who said, I knew I shouldn't have married her. Why did you do it? Well, I didn't think God was going to come through for me, or a young woman or whatever. And you see, the reality of it is, it takes courage. It takes that courage, believing God, trusting God. God's going to come through. And so the Bible says we're to wait patiently. We're to wait quietly. We're to wait in hope. But what makes it so hard for us to wait? Why is it we have such a hard time waiting? That is, what are some of the hindrances to waiting? Well, let me just give you a few. Jot them down real quickly. First of all, Satan says hurry. You know, one of Satan's greatest strategies is this. You're going to miss out. You ever go to a store and they say something like this? Well, I'll hold it for you, but there's two or three people in here before you, and I'd hold it for you, but I'm sure they'll probably get it. Or you're going to buy a car, and one of the things they say, well, you know, there's somebody else here. One of Satan's strong suits for you and me is, you better hurry. You're going to miss out. Do you realize it is an absolute impossibility for you to miss out if you wait upon the Lord? You can't. And so Satan tells us to hurry. And as a byproduct, many times we hurry into decisions. We hurry into maybe purchasing decisions. We hurry into relationship decisions. We hurry into occupational decisions. And after we get there, we would to God we had not made that decision in our life. Because Satan says hurry. Another reality why we have trouble waiting is because we just have pressure from other people. You know, while people around us love us, family, friends, and neighbors, unconsciously or consciously, there's pressure from others. Suppose that you're in between a situation and somebody comes up to you and they says, "Uh, what are you doing? And you give them a response. Well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to to direct me. He said, well, you... You better put mind and body to work and do something. And the reality of it is some of our closest and dearest friends can try to push us unintentionally out of the will of God. And, uh, you know, it's not hard to get out of the will of God. As a matter of fact, you listen to friends, you listen to neighbors, you listen to even Christian people. They don't know what God's calling you to do. And so we have pressure from other people, maybe a pressure from a Christian husband, a Christian wife, pressure, you know, pressure from uh, children, pressure all around. And so the reality of it is, is what a hindrance that we face is just that pressure from other people. We don't want other people to feel bad about us, but listen to me real carefully. At the end of the day, when all the dust is settled, they will not make the final decision, you and I will. David said, wait on the Lord. In other words, that means that there's going to be a time that you don't know exactly what to do and you just stay where you are until God says move. And so another reason we have a struggle is this. We're just activity-oriented. You know, a person who's activity-oriented really has a struggle waiting on the Lord. Well, you know, I'd rather burn out for the Lord than rust out for the devil. You know, you'll hear that said. What does that have to do with waiting on the Lord? Now listen to me real carefully. Use your God-given mind. Do you not think that God put the word wait in the Bible intentionally, deliberately for you and me to learn the process of waiting? Amen? But we're so activity-oriented. We despise traffic lights. Do we not? You're at a traffic light. We despise long lines. That's why, you know, there's a long line, you... Or whatever. 
But I'm here to tell you, I want you to listen. It's serious business when you've messed your life up. It's serious business because, listen, as I shared this morning, our children modeled their lives after us because we are all born followers. We follow somebody, and if they see a mom and dad that's just going to plow through and do everything they can, you're teaching your children to plow through and get what they can and can what they get, regardless of waiting on God. What do you think is going to happen to their life 10, 15, 20 years? They're going to be an emotional mess, not to mention a spiritual mess because they didn't wait on the Lord. And so we're so activity-oriented. And then there's another reality that we have to face is this. A lot of times we just view waiting as laziness. Now I want to tell you about a specific time in my life that God called me to wait. It was before I was pastor at Faith. And I was in between one pastorate and another one. I really can't give you all the answer to this very day. But I resigned one church after leaving as their pastor. And God called me to wait for four long years. And I kept thinking, God, you do know you call me to preach. You do know you call me to pastor. I never will forget one time in a moment of weakness in Charlotte's life. And, and we, I, we were both weak. She said, are you ever going to pastor again? I would have asked myself that same question if I'd been in her shoes. I didn't know what God was up to, but he did. I didn't know what I was to do. I just knew that I was to report every day for duty and be as obedient as I could possibly be in the situation that I was in. One year clicked by, two years clicked by. You say, well, what would you do? Uh, one person uh, I was talking to not too long ago sharing about waiting because they're in a similar situation. They said, what would you do for money? Well, one of the things I found out is God opened doors and opportunities and God did provide. But here's the reality. If I'd ever known when I went into the pastorate, that God is going to put me in a four-year waiting period? I said, no, you don't know what you're talking about. But listen, there is a school that God puts his serious saints in. Now, I want you to listen to the way I just said that. If you're not serious about your walk with God, you're not in that school. If you're just interested in being saved and going to heaven, you'll never get in that school. But if you're a serious saint and mean business with holy God, whereby he can impact the world with your life, There's a school he'll put you in. And that school will be a silent school. It will be a private school where he puts you all by himself and he teaches you things about himself that he teaches you firsthand. And you see, but a lot of times we're just not going to wait because we view it as laziness. Some people view it, well, I don't want people to think I'm lazy. Let me ask you a question. And let's just be real honest. Aren't we really a lot of times more concerned with what people think about us than what God does? Most of the time, we're really more concerned with what people think than what holy God thinks about us. And that's why we get ourselves in hellish messes. That's why we make decisions that are absolutely detrimental to our life because we're so important, we're so concerned about what does my friend say, what does my family member say, what does my husband. Listen, David made it very clear he was going to wait on God. He was going to listen to God. He was going to do what God said. And... uh, Another problem we face, we just want to live in the now. You know, a lot of people have to have it right now. I got to have that job right now. I got to get married right now. I got to have this right now. Can I tell you, if you live in the now, you'll never learn to wait on God. And here's the reality. You'll miss the wonderful life that God has in store for you. What would have happened if uh, Joseph would have lived in the now and said, you know what, I'm not going to wait. God, you call me, I'm 17, bring it on, Lord. Let's come, come on now, let's go, God. A lot of times we're that way. Joseph waited, worshipped, prayed, grew. Waited, worshipped, prayed, grew some more. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 41, verse 42, in one day's time it happened. Pharaoh sent for Joseph. And brought him into his presence. They cleaned him up. And Pharaoh found Joseph to be one of the greatest men in his age. And here's what he said. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. In other words, Joseph was the man of God for the hour. Why? Because he learned to wait on God. 
Would you like to have an impact in such a way that God uses your life in such a tremendous way? Then you have to understand that God's not interested in just the here and now. God's not interested in you just saying, well, God, I've got to have it right now. No. No, you don't. God says wait. And then there's one other reason why we're so concerned about waiting is this. We just have a fear that we're going to lose out. We're going to lose out on that job. We're going to lose out on that spouse. We're going to lose out on that career. We're going to lose out. So we're just not going to wait. The Bible makes it very clear in in another passage in Psalm. Those that wait on the Lord will never be put to shame. In other words, you won't ever be put to shame waiting on God. He has a way like he did Moses. Moses waited on the backside of a desert. It seemed like life was going by. But at the right time, and God catapulted him way out here in front of everybody else. Why? Because God can do that. And that's exactly what he did. I recall the story Dr. Charles Stanley told years and years ago. He said he was preaching First Baptist Church just when he was in his probably 30s or 40s. And uh, he said uh, we were just on the local cable in black and white and barely affording to do that. But he said, we wanted to make an impact. And he said, in the right timing, in the right way, God catapulted the ministry of First Baptist and in touch. He said, in such a way, he said, and the only way it could have happened was that God did it. Listen very carefully. You'll never lose waiting on God. You can't lose waiting on God. Well, what's going to happen to you if you do wait on God? I want you to jot these down. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40 for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 40. And I want you to look, especially in verse 31, but in verses 28 through 31. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, in Isaiah 40, 29. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But listen to verse 31. But they that, what's the next word? Wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. And not faint. Let me just give you some principles to jot down if you wait on the Lord. Number one, God will energize your inner being with a power and a force and a might from Him that's beyond description. God will strengthen you in the inner man. In other words, you'll, you'll be willing and able to wait. God will strengthen you. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 40. Listen, God makes it very clear. He says, you know, those that wait on me, I'll give you strength. I'll give you strength for the journey. Sometimes I, I think about how long God has allowed me to be in the ministry over 30-some years, and I think about my age, and, and I feel like I'm 25 sometimes. Well, a lot of times until, you know, get a little bit sleepy earlier in the evening sometimes. But he says, I'll renew your strength. In other words, there is serious, deliberate blessing that come to the man, to the woman that waits on God. Do you know that the Bible said about Moses whenever he got ready to walk off the earth that he died with the strength and the vitality of a young man? Moses, over a hundred years of age, he died with the strength and the vitality of a young man. Why? Because he waited upon God. He learned the life lesson of waiting. I'm not going to push. You know what we get in stress for? We have all sorts of stresses and, and all things bothering us because we try to push things that God is not behind. So he promises to renew our strength. And second of all, he said, I'll give you direction. You know, in, in Psalms 25, when you wait upon the Lord, He'll make sure you know the right way to go. He'll give you the direction. You don't know which way to go and you don't know what to do. He'll, he'll guide you. I've said this and shared this many times with you, but it's worth sharing again. I was sitting at uh, uh, our table at the house in Catlettsburg, Kentucky, and I was thinking, Lord, where should I, what should I do for college? Where should I go? And I can just hear it in my mind's eye. Go somewhere where you can get some Bible. And I understood that to be Cumberland College. And 
It's been a wonderful journey because God placed me in this area. He placed me in this location, placed me where I would meet Charlotte. Why? Because you won't lose out waiting on God. Don't ever think that if you wait on the Lord that you're going to miss some great blessing. You cannot miss the blessings of God if you will deliberately, intentionally say in your heart, I'm going to wait on you, Lord. I am not going to move unless I know that you're telling me to move. And then thirdly, God promises to strengthen us with His Holy Spirit. There will be a power and an unction from Holy God that is beyond description. God makes it very clear in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and other passages as well. There will be that strength, that unction, that power. You know, when, when you learn to wait upon the Lord, some of the, some of the benefits. And by the way, God says, I'll promote you too. Do you realize that one of the blessings of waiting on God is his, his promotion? Take your Bible and turn to... Uh, Psalms chapter 37 for a moment. Psalms 37. And I want you to look at verse uh, 34. And I encourage you to underline this. Because if there's one reason to wait on the Lord is to understand He'll take care of your life. You don't have to worry about self-promotion if you wait on the Lord. Listen to what it says. Now, first of all, understand, has God changed one ounce and one iota since the penning of His Scripture? Not one iota. He is unchangeable. So listen to what He says in verse 34. Wait on the Lord, keep His way, and He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Now, what is uh, the psalmist saying? He said, here's what you do. You wait on God, God will take care of your life. You, you make it your business to obey God. He will exalt you. He will exalt your life. He'll exalt your business. Listen, I listen to some Christian uh, businessmen from time to time, and it's amazing how they wait on the Lord and God exalts them. They wait on the Lord and God exalts them. They wait on the Lord. And uh, they are men who have, who have uh, stock in uh, New York Stock Exchange and Amex and NASDAQ. But you know what? They, there are some who said, you know what? We're going to wait on God. We're going to wait on God because, listen, the issue is not about my life. The issue is about me learning to wait on God. Now, let me ask you a real simple question. Now, God is never oriented for selfish and selfish motivations. But don't you think God loves you and wants His best for your life? Let me ask you this. Do you think His best for your life really outweighs what you think you want for your life? A million times over. Do you think Joseph ever dreamed when he was a little boy that he would someday be the second in command in the entire land of Egypt? Do you think he ever dreamed of that? Do you think that David, when he was just a little bitty boy, ever thought that he would be the king, the greatest king that ever occupied the throne in Jerusalem? But you see, here's what David understood. He waited on God. He got his mind and heart filled with the Word of God, the truth of God. He absorbed it into his being, and he just let God do what God wanted to do with his life. Think about it. God's not changed. And the reality about it is, is we say, God, if you can do anything with my life, listen, God can do whatever he wants to do, but here's the reality. Are you waiting upon him? Are you allowing your life to be used of him? I love the way the Living Bible puts uh, Psalm 37, 24. Listen to what it says. Don't be impatient for the Lord to act. Keep traveling steadily along His pathway, and in due season, He will honor you with every blessing. You mean that? Let me ask you a question. Can God lie? Never. Are you saying, Pastor, that's for me? Who do you think He wrote the Bible to? Do you think He just wrote the Bible to David and to those in that generation? Do you think he wrote it just to the Christians in the first and second century? He wrote it for everyone that would take him seriously. And you see, the Bible makes it very clear. He'll not only promote you, he'll provide for you. And one that is so powerful, he'll give you victory over your enemies. You say, does that come when I wait on the Lord? Yes, it does. I want you to turn to Psalm 37, verse 9. Turn back to, look back at verse 9. Evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait on the Lord shall inherit the land. You know why? Because when you wait on the Lord, when you're on the Lord's side and you say, Lord, I'm your son, I'm your daughter. Listen, when somebody stands against you, they're standing against holy God. That's why when there is a church, listen, 
It's no, when there's a church that's standing with God and obeying God and doing what God wants them to do, it's no accident that that church is being blessed. It's no accident that church is being blessed with lives coming into the fellowship and lives being birthed and God blessing finance. You know why? Because God says it's a big deal if you obey me. It's a big deal you walk in my ways. And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying. And one of the realities too is he'll deliver us out of intense situations. Jot it down. You'll be delivered from intense situations. You're in a situation, maybe you're in a situation of confrontation, and you think, what am I going to do? Well, God promised you. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined into me, heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. What's David saying? He delivered me out of intense situation. He delivered me out of a situation that I was in that I couldn't get out myself. God delivered me out of it. Do you realize that you are serious business to God? You're not just some human being walking around down here on this earth and and God is saying to you, do the best you can, I'll see you in heaven. It's sad, but there's a lot of Christians that have that type of mindset and that understanding. that Well, God's just going to see me in heaven and I just fend for myself while I'm down here. That is absolutely absurd and there is no truth about that statement in Scripture. God says, "You, you wait for me, you obey me, I'll assume the consequences for your life. I want to say that real slowly. You obey me, you follow me, I will assume the consequences of your life if you make it your business to walk with me. And you know what? He says, I'll never let you be embarrassed. You'll never be put to shame. A lot of folks tonight are... Not only embarrassed, but they're in embarrassing situations. They've been embarrassed. And some people are going to be embarrassed this week because God's going to embarrass them. By the way, God has a way of embarrassing us in a way that only He can do it. When we try to cover and pretend and try to be something that we're not. But here's what He says. Now, you know... In Isaiah 49, 23. Kings shall be thy nursing father, their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Here's what God's saying. Sir, ma'am, you serious about obeying God? You watch what I'll do. You'll never be ashamed. You'll never be embarrassed. And you know what that means? Now, parents, especially on this Mother's Day, here's what it means. I will honor your life and your children will be a blessing and you won't be embarrassed by their life because I see the type of life you live in front of them. There is power about waiting on the Lord. We live in a manipulating society and we live in a self-oriented society. Get it now. Get it while you can. But I'm here to tell you, if you will learn the biblical principle of waiting on God, waiting on God for that right spouse. Some of our ladies know. They put it to the test. You pray for that spouse God wants for your life. He'll come. She'll come. Be obedient to God. Do what he says. Because the reality of it is, God says, I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. I cannot forget you. Think about it. God is looking at your life and my life intently. And don't you ever think for one second that he'll allow you to be put to shame if you wait on him. Maybe you're waiting for something right now and you're praying about something. And you say, it's not come to pass yet, but you keep waiting. You keep obeying God and you keep praying. You may be waiting in prayer. You may be waiting about a relationship. You may be waiting about something else. But here's the reality. You can always take God to the bank on whatever he says. Those that wait on the Lord will never, and it does not lose the integrity of the meaning if you put it this way, will never, ever, ever, ever be put to shame. Are you waiting? Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. 
We thank you so much for reminding us of the significance of waiting. Lord, we live in a world of rush and hurry. We live in a world of get it while you can. But Father, you remind us that waiting is so significant. Lord, it's only those that wait that are blessed the greatest. It's only those that wait that are used the greatest in your kingdom. And Father, we live in such an instant society. I would pray that you would give each of us the boldness and the unction to wait courageously upon you. In Jesus I pray. Amen.